Hi, I'm Dolores Pretorius. I'm a professor of radiology at UC San Diego, and I'm going to talk to you this morning about pelvic floor dysfunctioning and imaging. I'm talking about pelvic floor dysfunction and imaging, and my disclosures are that I've had some software support from um, both Philips and GE, and I've also um, done some lecturing. Um, the objectives of this talk are to review the anatomy of the pelvic floor, to review the sonographic findings for fecal and urinary incontinence, and to demonstrate puborectalis avulsion and sphincter tears. Urinary incontinence, anal continence, and pelvic organ prolapse are all part of pelvic floor disorders. Any one or more pelvic floor disorders was found in 37% of community-dwelling women. When I read that, I wondered, what's a community-dwelling woman? Well, that is someone who is not in a nursing home. So people like you and me walking around. So in this study, there were 4,000-plus um, women from Kaiser who um, were from 25 to 84 years old, and they were just randomly um, identified by age, and 37% had one or more pelvic disorders. 15% were stress incontinence, 13% overactive bladder, 6% organ prolapse, and 25% had anal incontinence. So what are the causes of fecal incontinence? Well, muscle damage from childbirth is probably number one. It's possibly related to um, being forceps being used at delivery and episiotomies being done at delivery. Um, but it, not everything is related to childbirth. Some are hemorrhoidal surgeries, pelvic tumors, anal sex, nerve damage from childbirth again, from long-term constipation, stroke, nerve degeneration from diabetes, which we have a lot of today, multiple sclerosis, um, loss of storage capacity from radiation treatments and inflammatory bowel disease, um, diarrhea, um, and pelvic floor dysfunction decreased squeeze pressure, impaired anal sensation, rectal prolapse, and rectoceles. Um, how do we diagnose these things? Well, there are indices of different questionnaires, and probably the most popular one is called the FESI, which is the Fecal Incontinence Severity Index. And this um, little questionnaire has questions on the types of leakage, whether it's gas, mucus, liquid stool or solid stool, and the frequency of how often these happen. Do they happen one to three times per month, one time a week, et cetera? Um, you get a score based on your answers, and if you're greater than four, you're considered to have fecal incontinence. Now, what are the tests that we have available to diagnose these types of abnormalities? First, anal manometry is used where they test the pressures of the rectum when you do these squeeze mechanisms. Um, anal rectal sonography um, using 2D, endoanal, and 3D. Um, defecography using barium studies, proctosigmoidoscopy to look at the area, and um, anal electromyelography. What types of treatments do we have available? There's dietary changes, there's medications, there's um, bowel training, and then lastly, there's surgery. Well, this is an anatomical diagram of um, sort of like a cartoon of uh, the muscles that you need to know about. First off, the symphysis pubis is a very important landmark for us in identifying this region. Then we have the urethra, then the vagina, then the rectum, and then the muscles. Now, this is the puborectalis muscle here, but you can see there's a iliococcygeus, um, anterior sacral coccygeal ligament, and many people reference these as the levator ani. And so you'll find in the literature many different terms, but these muscles do come back here to the sacrum posteriorly. Now, how do we do these studies? We do them with a patient lying in the lithotomy position. If we have stirrups and we're in a lab where there are tables with stirrups, then we use stirrups. If there's no stirrups, then we let the legs fall against the bed rails that we keep up with a pillow against them and then the legs falling across. Um, there's two types of transducers that are being used. One is the 3D transvaginal probe, which is a 5 to 9 megahertz probe um, with a condom, of course. And... Um, that gives you better resolution, but the four to six curvilinear transabdominal probe sitting on the perineum gives you a broader based um, window to the um, hiatus. Um, the transducer is placed on the perineum near the introitus on the perineal body, and if you don't know where that is, you'll know in a few minutes. Um, it's very important to use a light 
touch as the transducer pressure thins out the external sphincter and can cause you to think that there's a defect when there isn't one. So in contrast to most of ultrasound where we push in the uh, pelvic floor, we want to lift up. Um, the, the dynamic information is very important when you're doing pelvic floor work. We look at it both with resting and with squeeze, and most of our um, tears of the internal and external sphincter are much more obvious on our um, patients where we contract and um, bear down than when we have the resting state. We generally have the patient hold their breath. You would think that it's far enough away from the lungs that it wouldn't impact it, but image resolution is everything when you're trying to decide these. And um, some studies are being performed with 4D ultrasound in order to see the movement of the pelvic floor. So here's a diagram with the transducer sitting right on top of the introitus. We do put in manometry catheters for research purposes, but this won't be done on a routine basis. Um, there's the window of what we're going to look at, and then we kick out a uh, orthogonal um, planar image where we have three perpendicular planes looking at that. We also in our lab have looked at the pressures, but that's basically been done for the research purposes to understand what we're looking at. So here is the um, basic 3D uh, multiplanar picture that we take. We start in the sagittal plane and acquire here with the anal canal and then the rectum coming down. And then we have the transverse image off to our right in box um, B with the puborectalis muscle there. And then we have our coronal picture through the anal canal. Now, if we take a slice down here near the anal angle, we will get a nice picture of the puborectalis, this white um, sling, and then the internal anal sphincter is the black. And then on the lower part, we can see here that the perineal body sits right on top of the anal canal, and you can also see the puborectalis muscle and the internal sphincter, the rectum is down here. And there is, again, the perineal body right there. If we go more um, proximally in the anus, then you will see the black ring again is the internal sphincter and the white ring is the external sphincter. Now this is just another diagram of the same thing, the perineal body right up here and here's our ring of our um, anal canal and we did some measurements here just to see what normal measurements were and once again the black ring is the internal, the white ring is the external. I like this picture from Dr. Timor Trish's paper because it kind of has a nice picture of the anal uh, canal right here and showing that um, if you are more um, distal um, here in the anal canal, then it looks more like this. And if you're more proximal there near the angle, then it looks more like this. The MRI is also helpful. This was a 21-year-old. Um, that was having um, probably asymptomatic, maybe it was a volunteer, I'm not sure. But notice how thin these muscles are that are um, drawn out here in this cartoon of the internal sphincter versus the puborectalis. And notice that the external sphincter has a little cup here that it comes around, and it's, uh, it's called the superficial part of the external sphincter that cups around there. But notice how thin these are. Now, maybe part of that is because of the um, coils that are in here, pressing everything out. But that's true for the endoanal ultrasound as well. That's one of the reasons I, we really like 3D um, ultrasound is we don't have to put anything inside the rectum. Um, here we have a beautiful um, picture from Timor Trish who coined this the mucosal scar um, star in the uh, middle of the anal canal and I really like that the mucosal star because it ends up being quite helpful to us when we have abnormalities. So here's an abnormal star and um, notice right here that you can see um, that being pulled up to the um, uh, anterior part, which is where the tear is. And notice this, um, normal for comparison down here in the bottom right corner, how smooth and round it is in comparison to how this is moving up in the star in this patient with a fourth degree tear. Now we did originally our research looking at using Photoshop to help us move along and we found the puborectalis muscle and watched it in the internal sphincter and the external and saw how it changed over distance as it went towards the anal verge. Um, but then our companies um, helped us develop these multi-slice or parallel slice techniques um, that you can see that the external sphincter is coming in right here. Um, there it is, the external, and now the internal begins to come in right in here. 
Um, and as you go along, you see here's some more of that external right there. Um, and then uh, once again, we're seeing both. Now at the anal verge, you can see that you have more of the external sphincter, and then at the midpoint, you have the internal and the external. And then as we get towards the anal rectal junction, we have just a little tiny bit of the external and much more of the internal. So that's the normal progression. Now, when we started using thick slice, we found that we could actually see these um, sphincters better. And so whether you use a small, narrow volume or thick slice, whatever VCI, whatever the company is using that you're using, um, you will get better pictures. Now, the measurement of that thick slice, I think, is not very reproducible from one piece of equipment to another. And on one equipment, we would use a thick slice that was like 10, and another we'd use it as one millimeter, and they looked very similar to us. So I'm not sure how the thick slices are working for the companies, but I don't think that they're exactly um, what they say. Um, here you can see disruption of that mucosal star going into that internal sphincter right now and probably going into the external as well. And you can see that on this um, rendered picture as well as right here um, where that is. Another picture um, of, of a sphincter damage as you see going up here. And um, notice that Valsky shows us that the um, external sphincter may look a little bit thicker right where it is. Um, when we have a tear here in the internal, that you can get thinning of that internal there and you can get thickening on the opposite side of the rupture. They called it the half moon sign. Um, and then once again, the mucosal star um, is abnormal here. Now, when you do thick slice imaging, um, the left hand column here, these are all normal. The right hand column here are all abnormal. It ends up that it's not so hard to decide that it looks normal to you. It's these abnormals that you don't know exactly what's abnormal. Is it just the internal? Is it the internal and the external? Um, here you have the entire um, rectum is a very thin um, little bit of internal sphincter. And here again, you have it being pulled up um, anteriorly. And so there's clearly an internal tear. Is there an external tear? You'd have to go up and down to make that decision. But just like ultrasound in other places, there's lots of artifacts. And just by tipping it a little bit, you make it look abnormal. But notice that the, the mucosal star is not really being pulled up here. And when you just rotate your transducer a little bit, you see that it's really totally normal. Now, when you look at this anatomic diagram of the anal canal, I think it's important to realize that the pubo rectalis is closer to the anal angle and that the... Um, external sphincter is um, closer to the verge and the um, internal sphincter overlaps the two other muscles. So when you look at multi-slice going through these, that's an important thing to know. Now the technique for the pelvic floor is a little bit different. Before we tip downward, now we tip outward and we take a high frequency probe and we place it on the perineum and we acquire volumes that we can see the symphysis pubis anteriorly and the um, anal uh, canal and rectum posteriorly. Um, here's another diagram of the pelvic hiatus. It's not quite perfect, but it's reasonable that we have this pubo rectalis muscle coming up to the region of the symphysis pubis and fanning out with its muscle fibers. It's not one little point it's along the entire um, part of the, pel the um, pelvis. Notice again the urethra, the vagina, and the rectum. So here is the transperineal view or the urogenital hiatus as it's been called. And you can see the pupil rectal, rectalis muscle. You can see the urethra, the vagina, and the anal canal. And this is a diagram that I think helps you just go along and follow that. Now, um, I think this MR diagram is very nice to show you that this pubo rectalis muscle, what it looks like here, and that it's right off the um, edge again. Um, and then when you correlate with the 3D and you get the planar information, here's the pubo rectalis very nicely with the symphysis pubis up here and then the urethra, the vagina, and the um, rectum. And then when we do that thick slice or narrow volume view, you can see the pubo rectalis muscles coming out, anal canal, vagina, and the urethra. This is how you do it. You acquire sagittal, and then you rotate this box C so that it's upright. Then you move the cursor up to where you think the symphysis pubis is going to be here so that here is our symphysis pubis, and then we rotate it um, 
on that dot so that the cursor is on the symphysis pubis over here and we rotate it so that we can get that in one plane. That plane is very important. I'm going to go back and show you that clip much more slowly now that you have the concept so that you can see how to do it yourself. Okay, so first you acquire in the sagittal plane right here. So here's the um, anal canal, here's the rectum. The symphysis pubis has to be over here in the left part of the image. So we went back and forth, back and forth till we could see it. Then we have our angle coming right down the region of where the um, vagina is going to be. So we've acquired, we're, we've swept it. Now we're going to um, zoom just a little bit. Box C, we're going to rotate it up so that we're going to get in that um, pelvic hiatus view. Okay, so now we're there. Now we're going to watch this dot. We're going to move that dot until it goes up. And now as we're moving it up here, we're looking in box A, and we're seeing until we get the symphysis pubis. Now we are in the symphysis pubis right here. There's the symphysis pubis. So now we're going to move the cursor in that plane from here up so that we know where, exactly where the, um, there you go, we grab it. We move it up to the tip of where the symphysis is. That is the tip of the symphysis pubis, and that is the same in all three planes. So it's right over here, and it's right down here. So now we have this here, and we need to rotate box B so that it is parallel so we can get this angle. So watch, now we're going to rotate it. Like a record player in the z-axis, there we go. Because now we are in this plane with the angle, is right here, with the um, cursor from the symphysis pubis located from box A. Now I know that you can replay that on your tapes or whatever, but the idea is now we have a perfectly reproducible plane that we are, everyone across the world is using to make our decisions about this. So when you think of it, the yellow line is the urethra, the pink is the vagina, and the orange is the anal canal, okay? And this is the angle we're looking for. We're looking for the symphysis pubis to the retro, I mean, to the anal angle right there, anal canal angle. And then if we put these measurements on, here is the vagina again, here is the anal canal, and here is the urethra. Now we did measurements in our research measuring areas, perimeters, all types of things, uh, volumes, but what panned out is the best is the anterior posterior length of the hiatus, and it actually is very simple. There we go from the symphysis pubis, where we put that dot, to the um, anterior part of the puborectalis, and we do it with rest, and we do it with squeeze. And you tend to be able to make your calls of your abnormals best on your squeeze um, images. So here are some pictures of a scoring of what was developed for MRI, and we're using it with ultrasound as well. And this is a normal pelvic hiatus. With, we count it as zero because it's normal. Nice, normal here. Here's another, just a little different, nice, normal pubo-rectalis muscle. Here on this image, this side looks normal, but this side just looks a little asymmetric and it doesn't look as tight. Um, this one looks thinner on this side. On, so we got a score of one. This one scored a two because you just really can't quite see it. And this one scores a two on both sides as well because of the, um, we can't see that pubo rectalis very well. Asymmetry is important when you're looking at these in order to help you make the differential. Now, the shape of the vagina is also something that we became aware of. We put a balloon in and we um, increased it with different sizes just to see what the, the um, area looked like. And you might think, well, this is really just research, and indeed it is. But look at this clip. really helped us understand what was happening. This is the vagina filled a balloon in the vagina. Here's the symphysis pubis over here, and here is our anal canal with our anal rectal angle right here. That is why we want to, the line to go from the symphysis to the angle, because that's where we contract um, when we do that squeeze mechanism. Now, MRI has been used to look at um, uh, the pelvic floor with, at rest and at squeeze, and you can see the diameter changes, the same angle 
changes. Um, and we know that on MRI that the pelvic floor is moving in multiple directions. It's not just a simple vertical direction or, or in contraction um, in an anterior posterior uh, direction, but indeed it is a vector. It goes up in a vector um, type position and we've been trying to figure out how to measure that. Um, but the rectum and the whole buttocks moves when you squeeze, so you can't keep in the same direction. Dr. Dietz did this study looking at how we um, move our levator muscles with um, Valsalva. And he took 50 nulliparous women who were um, 36 to 38 weeks pregnant. And he um, did the pelvic hiatus pictures with and without Valsalva. He taught them how to do a Valsalva. And um, he found that only um, 22 out of 50 decreased their hiatal diets like they were supposed to for a Valsalva maneuver. 11 out of 50 were able to decrease it after a secondary instruction. Um, but you can see that basically many women cannot Valsalva correctly. Um, that means that we have to teach people how to do this better. Um, here we have a picture on the left of at rest, where you can see the nice pubo rectalis muscle. And then on the first Valsalva, um, it doesn't really, um, it, it decreases instead of increasing. And then when we get an optimal Valsalva, we get our maximum extent here. So I think this was very important in confirming what many women already knew, that we didn't really know how to do our Valsalva maneuvers um, appropriately. We weren't doing our kegels in a way that was actually helping us strengthen our pelvic floors. Um, we just didn't know how. There are physical therapists that um, help and can put their hands in your pelvis and watch your muscles, feel your muscles, and tell you what you're doing right and wrong. And in France, every pregnant woman has a uh, has appointment with a PT person to help them do their kegels afterwards, and maybe this would decrease some of our pelvic floor incontinence if we knew how to do this. Now, the posterior compartment is um, uh, also something in, that we use for fecal incontinence, that we can not only uh, assess the sphincters, but we can also sus sus uh, look for other abnormalities such as rectoceles and intussusception. And these things can be detected on ultrasound. So here you have at rest the uh, defecography showing um, what the rectum looks like going into the anal canal versus with squeeze. And you can see that that angle changes. That's why everyone's interested in this angle being 90 degrees here versus 115 degrees here. So there is some degree of correlation with what this means. Um, here's a rectocele that you can see going up here that correlates with this defecography with the rectocele uh, blossoming out of the rectum, um, which certainly um, comes with people who have uh, problems with fecal incontinence. Now, this line from the symphysis pubis over to the rectum, it's that same important line, um, we can look at, look for cystoceles, uterine prolapse, and rectoceles. And even interoceles come down here and penetrate in, and um, these can be important for therapy. So here we have a patient at rest, and here's the um, urethra coming down, and then here we have a valsalva, and look what happens to that um, uh, bladder, that it funnels down into the um, uh, tissues, and that is a cystocele. Here we have a patient who's had uh, first-degree uterine descent um, after a birch copal suspension, which is one of the surgeries they do for um, urinary incontinence. And you can see that here we are at rest with the bladder, and then here we are um, with the bladder coming down towards the um, cervix. Um, here's a rectocele, another rectocele. There's the rectum, I mean the anal canal, and then the rectum coming out, and there it is. And here it was at rest. So that's what we look for to find a uh, rectocele. Now, there are slightly different appearances for interoceale versus rectocele. An interoceale, which is from the small bowel, peristalsis. Um, and there can be fat or momentum in it. And it usually is more homogeneous or nearly isoechoic. Whereas the rectocele is filled with stool, and it often has a lot of hyperechogenicity within it with distal shadowing. So here is a typical interocele, and here is a typical rectocele in a patient that you don't see it in rest, but you do see it at Valsalva. 
Um, here's a ure urethral diverticulum that, you know, now you know where the urethra is, and here is that diverticulum. Um, and sometimes these are more easily seen on the Valsalva again. And they can simulate a cysto or urethra, uh, cysto urethra seal, even though it's really a diverticulum of the bladder neck. Now, what can I tell you about um, stress urinary incontinence? Well, um, this is work that I've um, taken from the literature. I have to tell you, I haven't done a lot of work on the bladder itself. I've spent most of my research time looking at the posterior compartment. But um, different people are looking at the uh, bladder for mo mobility and for funneling, and people are developing ranges for normal motion of the bladder neck. So here we have the um, bladder neck right here in this patient at rest. You can see, once again, the symphysis pubis, the anal canal over here. And here we have first valsalva and then optimal valsalva and how much more um, descent there is after that. Now, um, the anterior compartment is um, where we evaluate for urinary incontinence. And Valsky talks about the height and the distance from the bladder neck um, and how far we go and also the posterior urethral vesicle angle. Um, in the pelvic floor. And these are numbers that they have developed um, at what the angle should be approximately at rest and at Valsalva, but um, we don't really have um, the abnormal numbers yet um, developed to figure this out. Um, the 2D ultrasound parameters are encouraging, and we think 3D numbers would be even better, but they need to be correlated with clinical standards and dynamic studies, which hasn't been done yet. So here we have the normal pelvic floor again, and here's one of these angles, one of these distances that they are um, looking at in order to try to figure this out. Now here is a um, uh, normal with the puborectalis muscle on either side, and then here is an avulsion with this pulling off here, and you see this ballooning out of the vagina um, and this retro, the space right behind the vagina here in the region of where that avulsion has taken place. Now, this is a, um, another picture of avulsion with the asymmetry that we see um, when we have an avulsion off the side. Um, this is a patient that um, has detachment, and the question is, is it artifact or is it real? And this one is really just artifact. You can make a defect just by being a little bit off axis as you rotate. So you need to be able to rotate back and forth and try to get the normal picture before you're confident that it's abnormal. Um, we do have different types of tape and surgical um, things that have been put in to try to help us for incontinence. So here's a nice normal picture of tension-free vaginal tape, and here's one that's kinked or broken underneath the urethra. Um, here another tension-free vaginal tape that you can see right here. It looks kind of like the stitches that we see with our C-section scars, and there it is on Valsalva. Um, as well. So it is in place. It's in the place, right place. And here's one called macroplastic injectable. That is a nice normal appearance of that um, from the literature. So the pelvic floor, um, I think, has these are some articles that you can look up if you'd like that I think are excellent editorial or review articles to give you an idea of what's going on in the literature. And I hope that was helpful to you. Um, and uh, thank you very much.